Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second uh, workshop on uh, podcasts. Uh, we started yesterday with Delphine Saltel, who spoke about storytelling. And today we have Peter Leonard, the, uh, an audio engineer, who's going to speak about uh, more technical stuff. Uh, I will be here to moderate this session. Uh, but before we start, I will give uh, uh, I will let Elisa Lado, the general director of the festival, to introduce Peter and say a few words. Elise. Yes, thank you, Yogos. Um, yeah, tonight I'm for the second day of our workshops about podcasting. Um, I'm very, very proud to, in the name of the festival, of course, to welcome Peter Leonard. He is an audio engineer in Gimlet Media, and he's also an audio educator in uh, the University of Columbia. Uh, and uh, Gimlet Media, I don't know if you remember, but the, the, this company with a Spotify original studio was mentioned yesterday by Delphine as a reference. So um, I think we are in the heart of the podcast industry tonight and the creation, of course, tonight. So um, Peter, uh, I give you the mic. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Elise. Um... I am so happy to be here. Uh, what an honor to join this amazing festival. Um, and uh, yeah, like uh, my name is Peter. Um, I, just like Elise said, I'm an audio engineer um, at, and sound designer and composer um, at Gimlet. Um, and um, what I want to cover today, um, is the use of things other than just dialogue in a podcast to enrich the story that you're trying to tell. That's kind of my overarching umbrella topic here. I am going to, during the course of this presentation, show you about a four minute clip um, from um, an episode of Science Versus, which is a Gimlet Media podcast that I worked on. Um, and the clip that I'm going to show you is from an episode um, about um, psilocybin and mushrooms um, as a psychedelic. So that's a fun, fun little topic for us to uh, be exploring today in this show. But um, what I... The thing that I want to emphasize with um, showing you all this clip is with this podcast episode, we could have chosen to tell this one, our main character, Joseph's story through dialogue alone. We could have just had this be an interview, could have just had this be speaking. But um, obviously throughout the course of this of the story coming together about Joseph, we um, as a team decided to put in a lot of other elements that would help tell Joseph's story. We made very specific decisions about where to put these other elements. Um, and when I say other elements, what I'm talking about is scoring, sound design, um, sound effects, um, and um, audio manipulation of uh, some of the spoken word as well. Um, so uh, yeah, just pay attention to where these elements come in and come out, how they are used to bolster the turns and the twists and turns of the story. So I'm going to start sharing my Pro Tools session with you all now, right here. So I'll just give you kind of a lay of the land first. The clip that I'm going to show you is about this, this long. You can see my highlighted uh, selection here. Um, this comes from a Pro Tools session containing, this is all of every little piece of audio that ended up in this episode of the, of the podcast. So just to give you a sense of what you're looking at, these top purple tracks up here, these are all music scoring. These blue tracks here, these are all sound design and sound effects elements. 
And then everything that's below this red, these two red tracks here, and everything down to my master meters, this is all dialogue. This is all the spoken word in the show. And so, where I'm going to plop you into the story. So, for this episode on um, the, uh, basically it's about the clinical uses of mushrooms and psilocybin to treat depression in patients. We follow the story of um, a man named Joseph. Joseph, um, up to this point in our story, has gone through um, quite a reckoning in his life, and he finds himself very depressed um, and is struggling with quite a bit um, around, and, and a lot of it is um, caused by his the circumstances around um, his divorce and some around his own mental health. And he decides, I need to pursue some something. So I need to make something, some change in my life. It's possible that going through a clinical trial of mushrooms, um, of the psychedelic mushrooms, might represent that change for me. So here we go. But obviously, he couldn't just pop into CVS and grab some mushies off the shelf. The feds still list it as a Schedule 1 drug. It's right up there with heroin. And then, so what do you do next? I just started calling everyone I could think of. You know, I literally opened up my contact list and my phone and going name by name and saying, hmm, is this someone who might know someone who knows someone who, you know, has access to psychedelic, you know, literally it was, it was that. I mean, I called people I hadn't spoken to in years, weeping. Finally, Joseph reaches a guy who knows a guy. And this is how he meets someone who we'll call Mr. Shrooms. He's not a doctor, but he gives people magic mushrooms to help with stuff like their anxiety. So, after a few weeks of therapy with Joseph's regular therapist, where he talked about what he wanted to get out of this mushy session, Joseph bought a plane ticket and flew across the country. You know, people were asking me, like, you don't know this guy. How could you trust him? You know, he could be giving you poison. Who knows? And I said, ah, you know what? If I die, I die. You know, I had nothing to lose at this point. On the big day, Joseph heads to Mr. Shroom's apartment, who had set up his guest bedroom for these magic mushroom sessions. He brings out some capsules with a brown powder inside them and some applesauce. Apparently, it helps the mushies go down better. And I said, all right, so, you know, we just open up one of these pills into applesauce? And he's like, oh, no, no, we opened 20 of them. <laughs> um, so we, we, we literally sat there opening up capsule by capsule and pouring the contents out into a jar of applesauce. And, uh, and then I just mixed it together with a spoon and just dove right in. Mr. Shrooms has Joseph cover his eyes with a sleep mask. Joseph lays on the bed. Lights go out, and some calming music comes on. And soon, it hits him. Oh my God, look at, I'm seeing all this stuff. This is crazy. What is going on? I started seeing metallic particles in the air, like glitter, uh, like confetti, like metallic confetti, but very, very slowly floating in the air. And then Joseph starts talking out loud, and Mr. Shrooms is writing down what he's saying. Wow, now it's everywhere. It's right in front of me, but it's a different plane. It's getting closer. Whoa, okay, so now everything is rotating counterclockwise, and I'm in the middle of it. It feels like a giant, cut-out, three-dimensional, not cardboard, of an eagle, a bald eagle. The top part of it has this presence of an eagle's head and the rest of the body, this feathery thing. There's this line. I don't want to compare it to ants. And through all of this, he started thinking about childhood memories 
and going through what had gone wrong with his wife. It was just me having a conversation with myself. And I was crying, I mean, in such copious amounts and in such an uncontrollable way. And I felt like my eyes were being pushed inside my head and were on fire and so much mucus was coming out. It was like just this major, you know, shedding of, of everything at that point. It, it hit me. There was a moment where I realized that I was done. After the whole experience, I knew that the anxiety was gone. All right. And that is where we will uh, leave this off. Give me one second to just change my... Boom. Okay. Now my mic should be uh, not just in your left ear anymore. <laughs> I had to do it to be able to show you the stereo um, image in Pro Tools. Um, so, um, yeah, there were sections that were intentionally, as I'm highlighting right here, nothing was done to them. There are sections where quite a bit was done to the dialogue. There are sections where the dialogue received not as much heavy treatment, but still some. And um, the thing I just want to emphasize is that we put a lot of thought into where those things should go. And so I think that the trap that a lot of um, th that a lot of early podcasters can fall into upon the discovery of the entire gamut of what they can do, all of the paintbrushes that they can use um, in audio, which is such a powerful medium, is that not enough mind is paid to whether you should actually do, whether you actually should realize um, all of these different types of colors and um, and proverbial paintbrushes, um, whether it is a good idea to have music come in right at this point, whether it's a good idea for music to come out right this point at this point. That is a trap that I find people um, run into quite often. And I'll illustrate something else that I find um, uh, in, in that I just see all the time in, in early podcasters. It's something like, this. I'm just going to take this music cue and put it right here, and I'm just going to take this music cue and also put it right here, and I'll take this one and I'll put it right here. You see what I'm getting at? The mistake that I see very, very often is overscoring, is, is using music just to be a constant presence in the podcast. And what I will say is that dilutes your ability to use a, a, a music cue entering or a music cue uh, uh, leaving to shape the listener's attention. One of the main things that I love that a, a point that I always tell my students is that people listen to podcasts passively. That is just an inevitable part of the medium. It's audio. You can do other things while you're listening to this podcast. That means that they're cooking, commuting, um, or biking, running, what have you. So that means that their attention is not, unlike a TV show, is not necessarily always at 100, somewhere between 90 and 100%. In reality, over the course of, let's say, an hour long podcast episode that's long but that is you know some some podcasts are an hour over the course of that hour you can kind of imagine that a listener's attention goes th through its own cycles like this perhaps you know 20 minutes into the podcast it'll probably reach a lull probably reach a low point that's when it's necessary for the podcast um for the episode of that podcast to um, make decisions about what other elements they can use to rein a listener's attention back in. Even just a long pause can make a lot of people 
What? What was that? Just look up. What happened? There was some kind of interruption in the homogenous texture of all of the audio happening. Even just a short pause can do that. So yeah, um, coming back to kind of like my overarching point about, um, about, this, about this whole thing, you need to choose very carefully where you wield these tools. Um, if you, as I was just mentioning, if you overscore, if you use music too often, you dilute your ability to use music to say, hey, you need to pay attention during this part. Um, and similarly, if you don't use if you don't use music at all, then um, you dilute your ability to just use the dialogue purely as uh, as an as an element to shape the listener's attention. Um, so, yeah, I guess my concluding thought here before I open the floor up to questions, because I want to spend most of the time answering um, your questions and pulling apart my session for um, uh, for you all to look at and for you all to absorb anything that you'd like to from it. Um, my, my final point really is just, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. The simplest way to address shaping a listener's attention is often the best. I can tell you that for this whole scene where Joseph, our character Joseph, is in the mushroom trip, this scene used to be quite a lot more dense. I built out something that was a big swing. It was a lot of sound effects. It was a lot of uh, audio manipulation to his voice. Um, I composed this uh, particular piece of music uh, custom for this scene, and it used to be quite a bit more, quite a bit more dense, a lot more instruments. And through discussions with the team, we decided that all of that density of everything that I was trying to do was too much. And, you know, I had to take that feedback and say, okay, yeah, the team was right. It's important that we get across what we want to get across. It's important that we, um, you know, paint a picture of what this trip was like to the listener. It's a fun scene for a listener to take part in, but um, we don't need the world. We don't need everything. Um, and so what we kind of landed on was somewhere in the middle of that big swing that I took of putting all this density and beautiful music and, and, and effects and sound effects and everything and something that's that was completely bare. Um, so, uh, yeah, with that, I will open the floor up to, um, I'll open the floor up to questions. And I'm here as well to ask those questions for you. So if you have any questions to ask, you can uh, uh, put them through and uh, we will answer them. We have uh, a few already. And uh, the first one to come in uh, was this, what pieces of equipment, equipment would you recommend for someone who wishes to start a podcast? And can you oh. give an estimation on how much it would cost? Oh, this is a great question. Um, three things that um, you will need off the bat, um, which really can be reduced to two if, uh, if, you're, in a, in, if you're in a bit more of a bind. Um, but the first and most important thing is a great digital recorder. And I would say, um, that it's it's important not to get the uh, cheapest thing here. This is something that will serve your entire podcasting career. So the ones that I typically um, recommend, either a Zoom H5 or a Zoom H6. Um, I'm going to post the link to... I'm going to post an Amazon link to an H5 in the chat. Um uh this is thing number one um i uh the zoom h6 is also a great um recorder just uh, the zoom h6 has just more audio inputs um the zoom h5 has two um two xlr inputs and then two internal mics um that i have found to be pretty nice um and uh this is the most important thing just because this this is the thing that allows you to allows you to capture the world around you um, allows you to gather any field tape go to anywhere that you need to go to be able to uh, you know capture the elements of the world that um, um, 
that uh, whose story he's telling. Um, and so, yeah, that that is thing number one. The second thing is you need some kind of digital audio workstation. Um, so I use, um, as somebody just in the chat uh, here just got it, I use Pro Tools. Um, but Pro Tools is not necessarily the, uh, the best uh, digital audio workstation for um, getting started in, in podcasting. It is a very bulky program. So the programs that I would uh, recommend, two that I would recommend to get um, you started. One is Hindenburg. Um, Hindenburg is a great, very simple digital audio workstation that makes, um, um, that makes initial podcasting very straightforward. Um, and when you're starting out, it's really important to use tools that have not a lot of friction, not a lot of resistance so that you can just move towards what realizing your vision without many roadblocks. Um, so Hindenburg, I think is great for that as well as, uh, Adobe audition as well, um, is, is a great sort of intermediate, um, digital audio workstation. Once you get into the, um, once you get into professional, um, podcasting where, uh, there are entire teams around, um, a podcast and people uh, responsible for specific parts of the podcast. For example, I am responsible for it, the post production of a podcast, all of the finishing um, parts, putting in scoring, mixing uh, the show, making, you know, um, cleaning up all of the voices and um, using Isotope RX to clean up uh, any dialogue problems, as well as doing all of this creative sound design and audio manipulation. Um, then you start to move into a world where Pro Tools is more necessary. I just got, um, there's, all, there's another question here that says, um, yeah, obviously I'm showing Pro Tools here. Would Logic, would Logic Pro X, which is Apple's digital audio workstation, would that work um, for podcasting? I love Logic. I use it to compose all the time. Um, I find its its interface to be very conducive to music for podcasting. I don't know. I think I would I would caution away from logic in podcasting. But I think it but I think it can definitely work if it's the one that you have access to. It's it's the path of least least resistance for you. Then use it. Um but there might be some things in it that make your life a little bit harder because it's so geared around composition and music. Um, so getting back to uh, this question, what's estimate? What's the price estimate for um, getting started in podcasting? Zoom H5 is $250. Some kind of digital audio workstation will likely amount to, a, if it's a subscription model, probably about $30 a month. So we're looking at costs of around $300 to get started. The third thing that I was going to mention that will advantage you is a really great shotgun mic, like the one that I am using right now. This is a Sennheiser M. Uh, let's see what the. This is a Sennheiser MKE 600. Um, this is on. This is a slightly steeper side, but I love this mic's. I, I love this mic. Um. Uh, and and this uh, a great sh a great starter shotgun I think from Rode like an NT um, like an NT uh, let's see what the exact model of it will will probably run you about two hundred fifty dollars American dollars which um, I'm not exactly sure what the exchange rate is these days but anyway um, it'll it if you choose to get a great shotgun mic to be able to supplement. Um, Oh, somebody just said something about Reaper. Totally. Reaper is great. Um, it's complicated, uh, and it, it might be a steep learning curve at first, but Reaper is um, a, an extremely powerful program that you can shape. Um, it is, uh, It is. since it's so customizable, it might be a bit of a beast at first. Um, okay. Um, Road NT 1A, is that the... Um, suffice it to say that by the end of this chat, I'll have that Rode microphone up because I can't remember the model number right now. But um, 
let me also get to some of these other questions. Uh, Yorgos, did you? Um, yes, there's sure. there actually two about sound effects. Uh, one is asking whether you create your own sound effects, and uh, the other one is you, if, if there's a library that you can buy them, and how does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I myself have never um, actually gone out and recorded. Um, that's a lie. I, I am lying to you. I'm sorry. I have recorded my own sound effects for a podcast before, but um, nine times out of ten, I don't. I pull from a library. Specific. First, I'll show you how I think about sound effects. Um, I'm just going to increase the waveform zooms that you all can see. Just these, uh, the waveforms and these particular sound effects right here. So this was, I'll just play a little bit of it. Uh, like confetti, like metallic confetti, but very, very slowly. So, okay, that's what I'm, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about sound effects. This, those like light, chimey sounding things that you can kind of hear. Um, I pull from. I typically pull from a library called SoundSnap, um, which you can subscribe to. Um, and uh, if you download, if you um, if you subscribe to uh, SoundSnap or any other library um you will pay either a monthly fee to them or you'll pay per sound effect downloaded um and essentially what you're doing with either one is you're buying a perpetual license to use that sound effect um and you don't need to credit like nobody i don't need to credit sound snap um in in our show or anything i have bought a a and basically an all clear license to um, to do it. But also I want to emphasize that for any one sound effect that, or that I want to create, chances are that I have to search for m many different, um, sounds to combine together to make the thing that I want to. There never is just one sound that encompasses what my, what my vision is. And for more heavily built out sound design scenes, um, especially with this show, Science Versus, um, very often I have to think about every single small detail about that sound scene. Um, for example, I designed a, uh, for an episode a couple of years ago, I designed um, a London bus station in the 1940s. And of course, I didn't just search a library, London bus station, 1940s. That sound doesn't exist. No, it was pulling apart every single part of that bus station and thinking, okay, what would be there? Crowd footsteps, crowd ambi. I had to specifically get crowd ambi of people with English accents because it's in London in 1940. Um, buses honking but the honks had to be period relevant 1940s relevant um probably horses clomping around as well um all these things are, are are things that you have to pay attention to what are the details of the scene that i'm realizing what are the details of the sound that i want to create here each of those details is likely something that you're going to have to find an in, in individual sound for um so yeah but if but um, unless the sound effects that you use are from freesound.org, which is a great resource, freesound.org for sound effects, unless they come from there, then you do have to somehow either buy a license or secure a license for the sound effects that you're using. And, um, I did see, um, um, I did see a question also about, uh, the music chosen. Um, most of the music for Gimlet, uh, productions is composed by people like me at, at, at Gimlet. Um, but, uh, and for every piece of music that we have to, that, that we put into a podcast, we have to secure a license for it. Um, unless, um, you're using, unless the, uh, music explicitly falls under fair use guidelines. You have to get a license for, for music. Um, 
and that has been a problem recently in a, in um, a lot of podcasts because many people don't know that, and so for during their show they will just use popular songs, um, and that doesn't fit under fair use, um, and that is a that is a litigatable offense. <laughs> um, so. Um, so yeah, and, and anything that um, people like me um, at Gimlet compose, well, automatically the company has a license to those since we're employees of, of the company. So that's kind of how um, music ends up getting chosen for our, for our shows is very often. We make it or we find it and license it. Um, Can I ask a follow-up question about the sound effects? You said that you can buy them off this library. If you buy it for a specific podcast, can you use it for another podcast as well? Or is it only for the specific podcast? That is also a great question. It's only for the specific podcast that you buy it for. Um, Can you, could I use this particular sound effect that I just downloaded for another episode of this podcast the answer is slightly more complicated i think that the license that gimlet has bought for SoundSnap means that i can do that but it depends on the license that you buy we're kind of entering an age in podcasting where accountability and fair use for music and sound effects is is actually ramping up quite a bit and so licenses are really important to consider and buy for any sound effects or or or, or music that you that you use it's uh kind of podcasting is transitioning away from the day from the wild wild west days when anybody could use where it was acceptable at least for anybody to use anything that's slowly not becoming the case anymore and it's good to be on the forefront <laughs> i think um yeah keep going there's a related question to that and uh, that someone asks at what point of the pre-production procedure do you start to propose the sounds and the effects in order to enhance and create the message of the podcast? Is it from when you get the script, for instance, or later? Oh, yeah. Um, so just a little bit of background about how an episode comes together. So specifically, I'm going to just shed a little bit of light on how a Science Versus episode comes together into everything that you see here in front of you. Um, the episode idea starts out um, as a series just of pre-interviews that uh, were, well, really even before that, the um, episode starts out as just a pitch um, that one producer has an idea for and uh, articulates. And then they start to do pre-interviews, um, gathering some data from experts, seeing if there's actually a story to tell around the idea. Um, and usually at around this stage, well, it's really the next stage that it can be useful for consideration to be paid about music and scoring and uh, and any sound design moments that we want to put into the episode. And that next stage is when they, when interviews actually start to happen and when a script around the interviews starts to take shape. So the producers for the show always uh, um, conduct probably per episode, I would say somewhere between 20 and 100 interviews. Um, Of course, only about three or four of those interviews end up making it into the podcast. And so, um, and so uh, from there, um, once they've distilled down the people that they, the interviewees that they want to actually include in the show, then um, some kind of narrative begins to take shape around all those experts. As soon as is, as soon as the team is able, I always like love to know about what the vision of the episode is. For example, when I knew that this episode was going to be about mushrooms and that they did want to entertain the idea of sound designing a mushroom trip, that's kind of when I got to work on creating a dreamy piece of music finding some sound effects that might work and then eventually when the tape around that moment actually took shape that's that's when i was like okay now the rubber is hitting the road so to speak i can actually start to put some of these things in sound how it's and 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 figure out how it's going to sound in reality so yeah at about right after the interview stage right when some of the script starts to take shape is is when i like to know 
sometimes I find out, sometimes I, uh, the idea is pitched to me like two days before the episode publishes. Sometimes that's just the nature of how thing of, of how things work. And I try my best to realize it there too, but this one happened in advance, luckily. There is a similar question. Maybe if you wanna add something about pre-production, uh, they ask, can you tell us about the pre-production stage, some techniques, methodologies, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak, um, explicitly to pre-production as well as many of my colleagues, um, can who work in pre-production and, and production since I am just, a since I work very largely in post-production, but I can tell you that what pre-production looks like in, um, very often is just interviews taking place. Um, just talking to the people that were involved in the story and recording that interview. And that is really it seeing if what they say in the interview amounts to something that you can actually shape a story around. Once you start to get an idea of what the story might be from all of your characters, that's when you can start moving into more complicated audio capturing, like, um, like going out into the real world with your recorder and rec and recording ambient sound of some important detail in the real world. But so what that kind of ends, what pre-production kind of end up, ends up looking like in a hopefully post-pandemic world, what it will what it will look like is you and your guest sitting together in hopefully a not very reverberant room. You have your digital recorder. You can either, if if you know, if you'd like to do it this way, you can either just park it between you two, just to capture the ambient sound of um, the interview, and that will likely suffice. Or if you'd like to go the slightly more technical route, that is hooking two microphones up to your digital audio recorder, probably two shotguns, just like this, pointing one at your, you know, one at host, one at guest much in the same exact manner as I'm sitting right here. Um, so that's all, yeah, that's all pre-production is. It's just going to whomever you want to tell the story, going to your characters and just recording them speak. That's it. Great. Since you spoke about going out in the real world, we have two questions that are kind of related. One is mm -hmm. a budget outfit for live recording outdoor. What about that? And uh, another one, have you ever done an outdoors guided tour podcast? And if so, since the audience will be already outdoors with the real sounds, would you choose to use sound effects or avoid it? Ooh, these are great questions. These, these are really great questions. I'm going to address the, um, so I'm going to first address what a budget outfit for live, for outdoor live recording first. Um, it just depends. You can you can record live outdoors with that very recorder with a Zoom H5, just just with that. Or you could go if it's if it's a band that you're recording, a concert, or um, if it's a panel, an outdoor panel. If it's it, it really really depends on what you're trying to capture. But if if you're trying to say capture. Um, a band or several speakers and you want all of them to have their each musician or each speaker to have their own isolated channel then that gets quite a bit more complicated your 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 budget goes from you know 250 dollars from just that you know digital recorder to probably tens of thousands of dollars um what i will say is that so many situations, in so many situations, you can just go with your digital recorder. And that's why it's important to get a nice one. Um, it will serve you in so many situations. There is, I found that um, there is somewhat of an obsession getting the, mo the clearest, most pristine audio. Let me tell you a little bit of a secret nowadays. Bad tape is interesting. Bad tape is good tape. As long as everything that's said is intelligible, as long as you can understand it, as long as you don't have to strain to hear something, that is 
perfectly fine. As long as the audio that you're getting tells the story, that's what's more important, not the pristineness of the audio. Of course, in Science Versus, we have had the opportunity to tightly control our audio circumstances. Wendy records in a little booth in her apartment. Our guest um, was was able to remotely record themselves. Um, Joseph, our, our main character. Um, but what I mean when I say bad tape is good tape is if in the middle of this podcast, otherwise full of very good sounding clear voices, we played a, a snippet bit of tape that sounded crunchy and kind of bad and not as and, and not as pristine that's interesting that's another texture that's that's a card that you can wield it not everything has to be pristine um okay and then um we have uh we've done an uh an outdoor guided tour podcast this is a really interesting idea i don't think that anybody really has done um some kind of immersive um sound walk outdoor um so kudos to you for having a really a great idea that i think it, that you can realize even just with a digital recorder like i was um mentioning i would say it depends on the goal of your podcast whether you use post-production sound effects or not if your goal is to paint a picture of what the of 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 nature as it is where you are if 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 say your podcast is about um is uh you know is is recording the hike up to mount olympus for example um i would caution away from using sound effects you want to be as authentic as you can to the listener you don't want to try to you don't you you don't want to lose their faith by using things that didn't happen in the scene itself but if your if uh your goal simply is to create the sound of the outdoors not tied to a specific place not tied to a specific idea of nature or anything just recreate just recreate an immersive sound of the outdoors feel free to use sound effects because then you don't have the expectation from your listener that you're using things that happened there so you see what i'm saying it just depends on what the scope of your show is well you just answered the question i had lined up which was uh uh if you want uh, the listener wanted to ask something about the sound environment we create uh, in your example it says does it make more realistic or it might give a theatrical point if you add you know more uh, effects and uh, uh, it, it takes away from the reality of the podcast. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Like, man, this is such a good point and one that I just want to capitalize on just by kind of reminding in the clip that I showed, there's a part after the mushroom trip here where Joseph reflects on his experience and he says... I can use what I learned during my mushroom trip to inform my behavior going forward. And it seems like a lot of my anxiety has dissipated. We didn't want to apply any sound design to that very vulnerable moment that our character is going through. Wasn't appropriate. No music either. Not appropriate. Um, if you have heavy, vulnerable moments that your character you know exposes themselves to in your story it's often a good idea not to try and supplement them ex with other things that can make it exactly what you said it can make it sound theatrical you can lose the trust of the listener um, um so yeah it's it, this is all about applying good taste when is the right time to use these things um is it helping or hurting the story that's what that's what run through, runs through my head with applying music and sound uh, design all the time. Is this helping or hurting the story? Sometimes I lose perspective of that, like I kind of did for this show, and I had to be reined in by the team. They had to say, Peter, this is hurting the story a little bit. Most of what you're doing is helping, but it's a little too dense. That's hurting the story. I had to see that, and I had to take that feedback and say, mm, yeah, you guys are right. It's true. It is hurting the story. Let's, let's strip it back a little bit. 
There's a question about uh, music and uh, music tracks, but I think you answered that already. Uh, the question was if you can use any music you want or you can just uh, buy from music libraries and it's pretty clear that you either compose it yourself or you buy the rights for the podcast. But there's uh, another question that asks uh, whether you use songs or music pieces as comments, as commentary to the story. And if oh. there is a special technique in editing in a podcast, human voice, briefs, and uh, the, the rhythms of the human voice. Oh, that second question is a whole presentation in itself. The answer is a resounding yes, and there is a whole art to it. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to scrape the surface in just a second. Um, as far as do I use music as commentary for... Um, so... I'm going to clarify a little bit what you're getting at right here. Sometimes in Pro Tools, I actually, um, in my music tracks, I um, make little dummy regions that I can put in as like, adjust this sound here. I, I, I will make little dummy audio regions that serve as reminders and comments for myself. So I'm not sure if that's what you were talking about, but if you maybe saw a couple of those um, in my session. Um, yeah, like right here. <laughs> end? Should I end this music cue here? Looks like I ended it back here. <laughs> um, anyway, um, but uh, if your question was, do I use music as commentary for the story? Yes and no. Um, I think um, it is not always a good idea to use music as a way to indicate to your listener exactly what emotion that they're supposed to be feeling a sad moment in a podcast doesn't necessarily need sad music chances are the listener kind of already knows what they generally be feeling from whatever transpires in the story um and so to score a sad section with something that is sad can feel cheesy. It can feel like full on lugubrious. It just can feel overwrought and theatrical. So very often for my music cues, I'm choosing really emotionally neutral things, um, things that tease out to the listener, hey, this, this feeling is evoked here, but not beating them over the head with it. Listeners, you know, they don't really like that. They don't they don't like explicitly being told what to feel. They like to draw their own conclusions. Um, and so that's that's why a lot of times the music that I use is very neutral um, and often very sparse too. not 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 a lot of instruments. And certainly I don't tend to use um, music and podcasts that have vocals in it uh, in them. I don't use actual songs really I'm, I'm using specifically tailored uh podcast music um and then so let's let's uh do a little bit of surface scraping on um uh dialogue editing so let me see if i can find um a particularly heavily edited section of audio here hmm let's just look at this so Oh, okay. Yeah, I did right here. The one of the main, one of the classic ways that you can use uh, human speaking patterns to cover up edits. Um, in other words, it's like you know, obviously Joseph, um, or actually, this is a this is one of our experts. I can't remember his name, but this particular expert that we're talking to, I'll give you a sense of what his voice sounds like. Oh no, not at all. Um, actually, uh, they're some of the safest drugs that we know of. Um, so he didn't say this piece in its entirety contiguously. We had, to, we had to edit him together. We had to pull from many different places to cobble together um, a coherent point. Um, and one of the most classic things that you can do um, in dialogue editing to cover up an edit is use a breath. Breaths are so valuable. Um, the reason is that a, a breath... Um, including a breath in a dialogue edit will synthesize a reset um, instead of placing an edit right in the middle of um, 
of a sentence or something where um, you might experience weird tone shifts between the two takes. You know, I, I know that many of you will un know the sound of a badly executed dialogue edit, which is something like this, where, you know, you have uh, the tone shifts like this. And it's very jarring. It takes you out of the scene for a second. Well, putting in a breath allows that person to go like this instead of having those tone shifts happen suddenly. So I use breaths all of the time to synthesize um, to synth synthesize a natural reset in the dialogue. For example, right here. It all responds. Um, what you can't say that about alcohol, which you can buy. Um, what you can't say that about alcohol, which you can buy. And for example, just if I were to cut out this breath, it will sound quite a bit less natural. It all responds. Um, what you can't say that about alcohol, which you can buy on the corner. So it's not actually that bad, but you can tell that there's an edit because nobody would naturally. Response. Um, what you can't say that about alcohol, which you can nobody buy. Nobody would would naturally come off this consonants of response and that quickly reset to continue their thought. They would probably say response. Um, so there's just a little bit of a tell that like this is that this is unnatural, that this does, didn't happen. And so the breath provides for that natural reset. And in addition here, if I had just, so let's listen to this particular dialogue edit where I used some room tone to cover up, um, to give the illusion that um, our expert here is pausing in his thought and then resumes. I'll just play it for you. Say that about alcohol, which you can buy on the corner. You certainly can't say that about opioids, which are prescribed uh, quite regularly. So. When you listen to this thought, it sounds, this thought sounds like a clause in and of itself. Um, well, you can't say that about alcohol, which you can buy on the corner. Which um, you can buy on the corner. That implies that he's going to take a pause right after that. Um, because it sort of is like a concluding sounding thought. Now, if I were to have executed that vocal edit like this. Um, well, you can't say that about alcohol, which you can buy on the corner. You certainly can't say that about... See, that sounds less natural because you're expecting from this concluding, concluding-ish or pause-ish sounding thought that he's going to take a pause. And so to make it sound explicitly natural... Alcohol, which you can buy on the corner. You certainly can't say that about opioids, which are prescribed uh, quite regularly. So I pay a lot of attention to how... When I'm trying to execute a dialogue edit, I pay a lot of attention to how those words would be said naturally. And then I try to recreate those circumstances, manipulating audio, moving it you know, around just like this. And, and one of the prime ways that I do that is using room tone, using breaths to synthesize a reset. Um, and very often also, let's just take a look at this edit right here, which I can see I didn't use a breath, but I did try to use some of the natural pacing of um, of his speech to inform where I put this edit. So I can tell that I put this, I, I do this always, and so I can tell that I put this edit here, right here, as opposed to right here, because I looked in this audio and I said, where did he naturally begin to speak again after ending with this word right here? And so I just took the audio and I just dragged it out. Oh, here's where he started speaking again. That's what I can use as my place for when I put in the edited take. You know, so that would probably go from sounding something like this. If you took psilocybin the same dose um, several days in a row, you just don't see that sounds pretty unnatural. I heard that, you know, of course, I, I said, OK, what to do? I'll use where he come where he actually starts speaking as. Just like this. Oh, there it is. OK, great. All right. Let me make sure I didn't break my music. Oh, I did. Okay, and then let's do this again. Those um, several days in a row, you just don't feel anything anymore. And 
So you can see that sounds way more natural, just using the natural speech pacing that um, that uh, interviewee used at the time. Um, and uh, here we even we have two more examples of me using breaths to cover up and edit. There's one right there. There's one right here. I bet that I put I, I, I bet that I put this where exactly using that same sort of natural pacing to inform or to put this edit. Let's just see i'm gonna drag this out get rid of this crossfade just for a second i did i did i must have dragged this out scene okay start speaking right there again all right uh -huh. okay so i'm just gonna get rid of this time right here or you use it again um i think i accidentally broke my music i did yeah so let's yeah, let's do that again before you use it again so you can tell i'm i this is how i think about dialogue editing it's not it's it's a lot less about technical things and it's a lot more mind paid to natural speech pacing and natural elements uh to inform the timing of my edits mm -hmm. well i have to say that that was thrilling it, it was like a very cinematic moment <laughs> and this brings me to another question how do you think uh, about audio design for podcasts? Is it different from audio design for TV or cinema or documentaries? Or do you basically use the same approach? Yeah, it's different. It's really different. Um, yeah, I, would, I, I do not use the same approach and I would caution everybody against using the same approach for sound design that you would in um, film. The reason is that for film, you have visual aid you have something to reinforce what um the what in this case the viewer is uh is experiencing in addition um in addition you have um I mean, just mixing in the film world in, in very often it's done in surround very often it's done to a dialogue anchor where dialogue is supposed to be at a specific level coming out of the center speaker. And that's fundamentally different from from podcasting, which is still primarily just mixed in stereo um, and that and that level of dialogue for um, for a film or for a TV show um, also means that generally you can have sound design and music pieces louder um in tv and in film than in podcasts because um in podcasts you don't you also don't have the person's lips moving that you can actually associate the words that they're saying with what they're with uh you know with the visual of them saying then you don't have that that to reinforce it so um, a lot of mind needs to be paid uh, to in podcasting as to whether your music or your sound design is distracting from or uh, is uh, masking the dialogue. Um, and I will tell you that I very often um, engage in healthy debates with producers of the show. Um, I tend to think that my, my music and my sound design can be a little bit louder and they want it to be a little quieter because they... Um, and um, I have to say that usually they are right. Um, usually when I uh, go off of their input and then listen to it later, I'm glad that I, that I did that because, um, because the dialogue in podcasting is the star of the show, always. Dialogue in podcasting is the star of the show. You, can't, you can do things that enrich it, but you cannot cover it. And that's not necessarily the case in film and TV. The visual is the star of the show. And that doesn't necessarily always include dialogue. So totally different approaches. Great. Uh, you, you spoke about this early on at, at your talk about the duration of the podcast and uh, some can last up to an hour. And someone is asking, is there an ideal length for a podcast episode according to you? Oh, I have my opinions, um, but I think that my own opinions are, and I think that I like kind of uh, shed some, um, uh, I did give some of my opinions at the beginning of this talk, but I think that those are less relevant. Um, my, my opinion is that an hour long podcast, that's a long podcast. I like them to be about 20 minutes, 
But um, that's just me. That's kind of because I like to listen for an intentionally short period of time. Many other people that I know like to have three hour long conversations like those of Joe Rogan or um, or Joe Budden or uh, many other um, podcasts that are specifically just supposed to be long form either roundtable discussions or interviews. You know, those can be up to four hours long. Um, and some people really like that. It just depends on what you're trying to do. For a show like Science Versus, which is dense in writing, where every single second is carefully thought out. Should we have music here? Should we have sound design here? Should we speak to this expert right here? Every single word that Wendy, the host, says is carefully written, then it's often better for those types of podcasts to be shorter. They're just so information dense. Um, and frankly, producing an episode of this level of detail that is an hour is a ton of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um, I, some, a, a kind of rule of thumb that I say for people is 10 hours for two minutes. Um, that's a little, in podcasting, uh, that's a little egregious. Maybe it's more like five hours for two minutes, but really it, it is, a lot more time and intentionality than people give it credit for. But at the end of the day, it just depends on what you want to do with your podcast. Not every podcast is just an interview between two people. Not every podcast is a conversation between, you know, four or five people and that's just it. But at the same, but, you know, on the same token, not every podcast is a carefully written, arranged um uh, discussion about all the matters of a topic where, you know, that is carefully put together like science versus is um it's all just different purposes different things that's one of the most beautiful things about podcasting so many things can be hit um and oh there is i, I wanted to address um i also wanted to address something that i see here which is uh um can i use um my iphone for a podcast the answer is heck yes yeah any phone any smartphone has the 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 mics in smartphones nowadays are exceptional and they will get you by um so i i think focus less on the equipment focus more on getting the audio that you need being being there for the things that happen um talking to the right people um don't be afraid to just be places and be recording with your phone, with your with your recorder, with your recorder and your mic. Um, don't be afraid. Just just record. And if and if it's not convenient to bring your recorder around, use your phone. That's it. Will sound pretty good. You you will certainly be able to get away with it. Um, so yeah, less about equipment, more about capturing the things. Mm -hmm. I have a question that was texted to me actually, and it goes something along the lines of. Do you, when you produce and you sound design uh, an episode or a podcast, do you think that you're doing it for people that are going to have uh, their attention focused on it or for people who are cooking while listening? And does it make a difference to you? I'm, so I will, the answer, fly, it's somewhere in the middle. I'm putting in, usually, my intention behind these things is to put in something that will shape the listener's attention if perhaps they're paying attention passively something you know for just as an example the start just the start of a music cue caused nausea though in one study 15 percent of people puked and it ramps up your heart rate but one reason that al says this drug tends to be safe is because you can't really overdose on magic mushrooms. With something like heroin, you can keep taking it, getting higher and higher and higher. Just that introduction of a music cue makes you, makes you pay attention if perhaps your attention was elsewhere for a second. But if you were paying attention the whole time, then this is still interesting. It, this still shows you there's a turn that's happening in the story. There's something that maybe you need to pay a little bit more attention to. Um, and we specifically chose to start this music cue here because Wendy just got done saying, but one of the most interesting things about psilocybin and mushrooms is that it's very hard to overdose on it. Let's talk about that more. The, the music cue entering says to the listener, we're going to go in depth on this. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it is, um, 
you're not ever i i never just intentionally make things for one type of listener i try to do things that work for everybody that serve different purposes perhaps for different types of listeners but at the end of the day it's all about shaping your listeners attention around the story and making them and 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 just trying to push them to pay attention at the parts of the story that you want them to pay close attention to or highlighting the most important parts of the story. Well, there is a, a huge part of uh, technical wizardry that goes into what you are doing. Uh, but, you know, there is this uh, distinction between uh, the, the technical part and the storytelling part. But for me, seeing you work now and see, showing us how you do it, for me, it's another form of storytelling. Yeah, with, without words. I mean, it's two kinds of storytelling combined. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, technical uh, things are only useful in so far as they help the story. Um, I don't just, you know, I, I of course, I, I, I have a very specific process by which I mix Wendy, the host's voice. I have a very specific set of plugins that I put her through, but it's just in the name of getting her to sound clear and intelligible. Um, you know, it's it's not in the name of trying to make her sound larger than life or make her sound as as good as possible. That's not the that's not the reason that you would listen to this podcast in the first place. You listen to science versus because you want to learn about science. <laughs> so, yeah, it's so again, technical, you know, diving in, doing a deep dive on, on technical things and learning about this stuff is only useful in so far that it helps a story. Well, uh, we, we went through all the questions that we had, uh, and that was a, a really great session, I have to say. It convinced me to, you know, try my hand at it. And <laughs> no, I won't. Don't worry. Uh, but uh, if there's anything else that you want to add before we wrap it up, uh, that is the time to do it now. Um, well, I just want to emphasize how much fun I have had uh, doing um, this and being in front of you all. Again, what a huge, huge honor. I appreciate so much. Um, uh, Nikos, who um, who asked me to to do this, I I, I just uh, I appreciate the existence of this festival and that you reached out to me so much. I can't tell you, just re <laughs> I'm gonna repeat myself, but it's been so fun. It's such an honor. I can't say that enough. Um, Ifikenia uh, posted um, a link to um, the show that. Uh, to science versus and i am going to just do a quick google search so i can post the link to the specific episode if you want to listen to it mushrooms science versus aha uh -huh, there we go all right let me and here is this boom that is a link to the entire magic mushrooms episode if you want to listen to it it's a great episode uh you got a little preview of it today um i work on a show now called how to save a planet um which i would also recommend if you're into climate change um and uh yeah happy storytelling happy podcasting i really hope uh that this has served as something that has just drawn your attention and your taste to certain things. I don't I don't really want to tell you how to do explicitly how to do things. I want to show you that uh, podcasting is a matter of taste and applying taste well. Um, so yeah, I, so in that in that uh, regard, I hope that this has been really helpful and good luck. It definitely was and thank you very much for being part of this. It was uh, our honor. Uh, it was brilliant actually, I have to say. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, everyone tune in tomorrow. We have uh, Gordon Firemark, a lawyer, who's going to speak about uh, copyright and legal issues. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.